I would like to talk about game theory. It has been said that life is a game. Do you know by chance who said this? Well, it turns out that quite a few people did uh, say that uh, very <laughs> But uh, the games I will be talking about today are not life. Uh, instead, they will be a model of life. And being a model, being a model has some implications. For one thing, they are incomplete. They are simplified. The life is complex, multifaceted, and the games we are going to be talking about today are very simplified models of life. They include some particular features of life and ignore other features. From the other hand, being uh, a model makes that it is computable. So we only model few features of life, and because of this, we can actually find a solution numerically for this situation. And the other consequence of this simplification is that they are universal. So there is a number of different life situations that are complex that can be modeled with one simple model, same model. And finding solution for one model uh, will make uh, this solution applicable to, uh, to other situations that can be modeled in the same way. Okay, anyway, so what are the games I am talking about? Give me some examples. So one example, really simple is a coordination game. Uh, coordination game is as following. There are two people, they're heading towards each other, they have no interest in each other whatsoever, but if they just keep going, they will collide and they will be unhappy about it. So they have to step aside. The problem is that if they step in the same direction, they will still collide and still be unhappy. If they step in different directions, they will pass by each other and they will be happy. So very simple decision to be made. The other game uh, I will be talking about is called Mash and Penis. In this variation of games, there are two players, say me and you. Each player has a coin, a penny, and each player can put his uh, coin heads or tails. And if pennies match, if there are two heads or two tails, I take both coins. If they don't match, if there is one head and one tail, then you take both pennies. Okay, so another really simple game. Uh, what game theory can allow us to do with games like this? So we study these games with so-called normal form of a game. And I will present you a normal form of coordination game. So we write down a table like this, and uh, there are two players, so one table is modeled in rows and, and the other is modeled in columns. And in each column we represent uh, write down strategies for one, uh, one player, in rows we write down strategies for other player. So in the coordination games there are two strategies possible, step left and step right. And because you, uh, people are facing in opposite directions and uh, stepping left uh, actually means different, different directions, so if they both step left they pass by each other and they're happy. Uh, we denote this by, uh, by writing down something like this. So at the intersection of some row and some columns, we know what one player did, we know what other player did, so we know what exactly happened in this variation, uh, in this round of game, and we can judge how much did each player like what happened. And we denote it with some numbers. High number corresponds to situations that player liked more. Because there are two players, there are two numbers uh, that denote how much each player liked this particular outcome. So this one slash one means that player one has liked uh, this outcome one unit of utility and player two liked it as a one unit of utility. They passed by each other, they're happy. Uh, if they didn't pass by each other, they collided, they're both unhappy and their payoff is minus one. Okay, so that's a normal form of coordination game. Let's write down a normal form for games of matching pennies. So if we both had heads, uh, we put our coins heads, that I've got one penny, I'm happy, my payoff is plus one. You are not happy, you lost your penny, your payoff is minus one. Same for two tails, and if pennies didn't match, if you took my penny, then I am not happy, and you are happy. So again, very, very simple game with very, very simple decisions to be made. However, when we compare these two games, we already see that there is something interesting, different about these games. Specifically, we see that in this game, the sum of payoffs for two players is different. Sometimes it's plus two, sometimes it's minus two. With game of matching pennies, the sum of payoffs is always zero. Hence, we have so-called zero-sum games, like matching pennies. 
these games are characterized by the fact that sum of payoffs for both players is constant. It would be more correct to call them constant sum games, but traditional they call zero sum games. If sum of payoffs is constant, this means that my wish is death is necessarily your loss. I can only win and get more utility by you having less utility. Because of this, this game encourages competition. However, with positive sum games, like the games of coordination, sum of payoffs depends on the outcome. There might be some outcomes that are beneficial to everybody. And my win is, necess is not necessarily your loss. My win can also be your win. So sometimes this game can encourage competition. So we have some games which encourage competition, which ha we have some games which that encourage cooperation. Interesting. Let's start with a more complex game. And this will be a prisoner's dilemma. So the setup <laughs> for prisoner's dilemma is as following. There are two criminals who committed a series of crimes and during their most recent crime, they were caught by, by police. And police interrogates each of them separately and asks them to provide evidence for the past crimes they committed. And each of these criminals has two options. Either to keep silence and do not betray his uh, col colleague companion, or to confess and provide evidence for police. So if they both keep silence, uh, they can only be charged with their most recent crime, where they were caught red-handed. And so they receive a small uh, prison sentence, and it's, it's a small sentence, so they both receive relatively high payoff, 7-7. Seven, seven. Uh, be mindful that here payoff is something good, so how much did they avoid prison? So more time in prison is lower payoff, and so lower number in this table. So if they both keep silence, they have a small prison sentence. If one of them uh, confess and does it keep silence, then the one who confessed and provide evidence gets out of the jail free, and the one who did keep silence and was betrayed, he is in prison for a long, long time. So his payoff is zero, and for the betrayer, the payoff is very high extent. If they both confessed, if they both provided evidence, they receive a small reduction in their, of their sentence based on their cooperation with police. So they both receive a small payoff of three. Now, let's imagine it's me, and I am one of these criminals, and I'm trying to figure out what is a rational thing to do in this situation. Okay, so I don't know what other person is going to do. If he is going to confess and provide evidence, then I have two options. I need to go in jail for a real, real long time, if I remain faithful to him, or, to, or I receive small reduction in sentence because I cooperated. So in this case, it's more efficient, more reasonable for me to cooperate and to provide evidence. However, if other person kept silence, he was faithful to me, again, I have two options. In one case, I receive a small sentence based on our most recent crime, or I go out of jail free if I betray him. Again, the rational decision for me is to betray, regardless of what he did. And same for him. So the action done by two rational agents is mutual betrayal, this one. However, if we look at some of payoffs for two players in this case, we see that this is literally the worst possible scenario. The combined sentence they will get, get is highest, and the combined payoff is lowest. So what we would like to see, we want to see people cooperate with each other and don't betray each other, and want to do this. In this case, their mutual payoff is the highest. But this is not what rational agents are likely to do in this case. Okay, so this is sort of the problem. And people are studying different versions of this game, and one of the most known versions of this game is called Iterated Prisoner's Dilemma. In this case, there are two players that play Prisoner's Dilemma against each other, but they do it several times in a row. So we have a number of iterations, and during making decisions on next iterations, we have access to information what happened during previous iterations. Was I betrayed or was I not? And because this is a different game, in this game there can be different strategies. Uh, I will present you three very simple strategies in this case. Actually, there are a lot of strategies, and people are debating what is the best way to play it, and there are tournaments played, so you can submit your program, and it will compete against other programs, and interesting things happen. But today, I will present you three very simple strategies. So, Fool is unconditional cooperator. He always cooperates. He never betrays. Villain is the opposite of Fool. He always betrays. And we also have this interesting guy called Avenger, uh, this guy uh, 
at first iteration he cooperates, and at every next iteration he repeats the, pre the previous action of the opponent. He is also called tit for tat or I for an I or cause or So these are the three possible strategies, and how do they play against each other? So let's start with adventure and fool. Neither of them uh, betrays first, so they will just continuously cooperate with each other and receive this payoff 7-7. Seven, seven. Uh, then we have villains playing against fools, and villains betray fools. Fools allow them to be exploited, and so they pay off this 10 by 0. We have villains playing against villains, and they just constantly betray each other. It's 3 by 3. But we also have this interesting match of adventure against villain, and what happens is that on first iteration, the villain betrays Avenger, and he and Avenger tries to cooperate and he's exploited, but in it, every next iteration, Avenger avenges, and villain is villainous, so they betray each other. So on average, uh, the payoff for them is close to 3 by 3, because there is a lot of uh, defections. But because of this small, uh, because of this first round, the payoff for the villain is slightly higher and the payoff for the Avenger is slightly lower. So let's say it's four for villain and two for Avenger. Now let's imagine that there is a whole population of agents. They meet, meet, meet each other, they play this game against each other, and if agent receives a lot of payoff, he has a lot of resources and he does what people with a lot of resources do. He reproduces. And he has a lot of offsprings. And if you did not uh, get a lot of payoff in this game, you have no resources, you can't reproduce. So what happens? Let's start with the population where uh, there is an equal number of fools, villains, and adventures. And fools are this blue line, adventures are red, uh, yellow line, and villains are red line. So what starts happening? Uh, we see that uh, villains are really good at exploiting fools, and this is the highest uh, payoff possible in the game. So they have a lot of resources, resources gathered by exploited fools, and their population rises. At the same time, fools are exploited, they don't have any payoffs from it, and their population goes down. Avengers are, at this point, more or less steady, because they uh, are, benefited, are benefited by the fact that fools are... Uh, the, the, the share of payoff, uh, of total payoff held by fools is shrinking, so everybody else gets cut of what fools lost. Okay, so that's the first thing that starts happening, and we see that the population is dominated by villains. However, then we see that some different dynamics starts to happen. When there are almost no fools left, villains don't feel that good anymore, because there is nobody to exploit, and villains are terrible in playing against villains, and terrible in playing against uh, Avengers. So, at the next stage, we see that this uh, uh, tendency continues, and actually villains start dying out because there is no, there are no fools to exploit. They cannot do anything else but exploit the fools. And we see that Avengers have their revenge, and they start to dominate the population. And at the end, we have a situation when everybody but Avengers died out. So this tit for tat strategy is considered to be standard response to a prisoner's dilemma game. What's interesting is that if at this stage where a population is comprised entirely from Avengers, we add some fools back, and fools actually will be quite okay in this population because there are no villains to take advantage of them. Uh, okay, so this is the iterated prisoner's dilemma game and this complicated uh, population dynamics is great. What are the applications of this game? Well, one of the applications is arms race. So we have USSR, we have US, and they can create nukes to threaten each other with nuclear war. And actually, they have much better things to do with their resources and create nukes. But if you have nukes and your opponent does not, you can force any action upon your opponent and you're in a very good situation. It's like he cooperated and you betrayed him. So they try to be tough, they try to betray, they try to have a lot of nukes, and they realize that it actually does not play out very well. And we see that by the 30 years after the start of the arm race, they actually started reaching agreements about how they both cut the number of nukes. So that's an example of prisoner's dilemma. The other example is known as the tragedy of the commons. This is also a classical story created by some uh, popular guy, I, I, I forgot his name. But the story is following. This is how we basically got Sahara. There is a, some tribe, so we are living in prehistorical communism, 
we are egalitarian, and everybody has cows. And we have some place where we can grease these cows. And this place, this piece of grass, doesn't belong to anybody, and we can grease our cows there as much as we want. But if we grease our cows a lot, our cows are getting fat, and we have nice fat cows, but also there is less and less grass in this place, and this shared resources gets exhausted. And this is exactly what happens with commons, with shared resources. Nobody cares, no, nobody considers them private, nobody cares about them, they are getting exhausted. We already have Sahara, that's how Sahara was created, it was a fertile land once. Now we don't care much about Sahara, but we have the same situation basically with every ecological problem. So all these emissions, greenhouse gases, plastic, that's exactly the, again, iteration of tragedy of the cars. Cartels, like OPC cartel. Uh, again, we have classic prisoner's dilemma uh, situation. If I am Iran and you are Saudi Arabia and we are both producing a lot of oil, we can agree to limit oil production. So oil prices will be high and we both will receive a high payoff. However, if you limit your production and I don't limit mine, then I will be able to sell my huge amount of oil at high price and I will receive a ton of money and you will receive few because, you, because I will be able to drop prices and you produce little oil. If we betray each other, we oversaturated the entire market with oil, so not good for anyone. And that's basically what we see if, uh, in Middle East. So when there is a war in Middle East, if people need money urgently, they break their uh, OPC obligations, they overpump oil, production increases, uh, prices go down. If there is a relative peace there, people try to cooperate, uh, they limit the production and prices go up. Of course, with recent technological developments, this example is getting less and less relevant, but uh, we still have this OPC concept, and so I, I keep showing it in my game theory. Uh, okay, so I was talking about game theory, I was uh, talking about agents, strategies, rational decision. What about ethics? Maybe ethics is just not there. Well, I don't think so. Because uh, if you look at any of the tables I have shown today, like this one, we have these numbers in table. And these numbers uh, denote how much did you like particular output. So this is an abstraction. And this is abstraction according to your values. So if your values are egoistic, then these high numbers for you represent high fulfillment of your egoistic values. If you are an altruist, then these numbers represent uh, how efficient you are in fulfilling your altruistic values. So game theory is just a tool which helps you to be rational and receive a high payoff. It doesn't tell you what is your payoff, what are your values, what you care about. They see that this dynamics like iterated prisoner's dilemma is basically the reason why things like free popular science talks are proliferating in the world. So uh, at the end of my talk, uh, I would like to put this guy again. So I have some suggestions for you. Play good, play rational, and remember what your real values are. Thank you for your attention.